So now we are talking with Drs. Michael Aie and Anya Portyankina, who run a citizen science project looking at the surface of Mars. Uh, people who participate in this project can help find and analyze jets of material that spray up from the ground, and it helps them understand wind patterns in different locations around the planet. Uh, Dr. Portyankina brings an expertise of ices in the solar system, studying those with data from spacecraft and from experimental labs around the world. And Dr. Aie creates new and innovative ways of analyzing data using a variety of programming languages and works with instruments studying Mars, the Moon, and Saturn's rings. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you for great having introduction. us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So I just wanted to start off real quick and get a little bit of information about you guys. Um, so aside from the citizen science project, what are your sort of main fields of study? What is it that you like working on? Yeah, so um, as you said, I am uh, interested in everything I see in solar system. So uh, all the surfaces that have ice, Martian polar regions, are uh, my first and prime interest, but I'm also doing some of the uh, outer icy satellites, so the satellites of Saturn, um, a little bit Europa, a little bit of Moon as well, also on the surface. Uh, yeah, but my main interest is seasonal activity in the Martian polar regions, so everything that relates to ice and atmosphere interactions over there. All right, yeah, and uh, my main interest actually, I think, over the years has. Uh, uh, me more pointing towards data analysis, uh, meaning the power of uh, really um, good math applications on uh, multidimensional data sets and correlations between different data sets. Uh, but I'm also very interested in creating new instruments and making these measurements the best they can be. So I'm involved a little bit with the calibration or maybe actually more than a little bit uh, uh, involved with the calibration of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Thermal Radiometer. Um, this is where we try to measure the coldest temperatures, uh, well, also the hottest, but I'm fascinated by the coldest because there is less photons per second, so it's, it's kind of a signal-to-noise problem, and uh, you have to be very careful with uh, what you know about the instrument to understand how cold it really is on the moon. And yeah, the other um, data analysis task that I really like is the complexity of the Saturn rings because it has so many patterns that uh, I always describe as some kind of visualization of math or the complexity of math because we think uh, that these structures uh, occur due to interactions between the, uh, the ring particles and the moons in very really complicated math uh, resonance interactions and they are totally different depending on where in the radius in the uh, southern rings you look. And I'm trying to come up with uh, image analysis routines that kind of quantify these structural differences per ring radius so that we can uh, maybe come up with equations that uh, describe better why these sharp boundaries, for example, exist in the C ring or why the clumpiness uh, is different in different areas of the southern rings. But uh, the uh, just one last thing: the where the things are combined. As my started uh, my work started as looking over the shoulder of Anya with her work on the South Polar area of Mars, and uh, there <clears throat> I also focused on the data to make it basically more uh, make us more capable in analyzing more data in a faster time by doing parallel parallel map projections routines for the for this huge gigabyte size high-rise images. So it sounds, Michael, like you have a really strong background in mathematics. Is that something that you studied by itself before you got into the astronomy part, or did that come kind of with the astronomy? Uh, it's actually, so I'm a, I am by education a high energy astrophysics uh, guy, so it's kind of funny. Um, math comes only as the thing that you need to study for uh, theoretical particle physics, uh, where some really obscure math happening, but otherwise math was really never my strength, my, my strength really. Uh, but when you now uh, go into the fields of machine learning, there you need to go back and uh, uh, relearn the math of um, linear algebra, uh, because that's really uh, important. And I think a vastly undertaught subject at university because uh, 
I think Anya will agree, over 10, 15 years of actually doing hands-on science, the one thing that always comes back to me is matrix operations, matrix multiplications. That's the linear algebra. Uh, and uh, I think that's you always need, and even more so in machine learning, which is becoming a everyday more popular subject. Sure, absolutely. Well, it's, that's good news to hear because this past semester I just finished my uh, differential equations course. So it, with linear algebra, and it was kind of a side by side thing. So that, yeah, it's that's good. good. To have that linear algebra. Cool. So let's talk a bit about the citizen science project that you two are working on uh, with the with the fans and jets on Mars. Can you tell us just kind of like intro us onto this project, how it started and, and kind of what it is? So sure. So uh, the jets on Mars, not many people actually know that we have something like geysers erupting in the southern polar regions, well, actually in both polar regions, but we uh, focusing here with this project on the south. Um, so let's start from the background. Uh, every year on Mars in, in polar regions, CO2 deposits as an ice layer. So similar to how snow falls in our winter in high latitudes, uh, but on Mars it's CO2. CO2 or what we usually know here as a dry ice, something that you use to cool your drinks maybe. So that ice is a little specific and uh, particularly because on Mars, the conditions are such that it can either exist as ice or gas. So as a gas, it contributes to the atmosphere, 95 plus percent of Martian atmosphere is CO2. And as the ice, it deposits in winter hemisphere on the surface. So then what happens actually in early spring uh, after a polar night, again, similar to Earth where in high latitudes on Earth, you have polar night for several months, there is no sun at all. And then in spring, the sun comes up. And what's fun part about CO2 that it's actually transparent for visible radiation and opaque for thermal radiation. Uh, analog might be the greenhouse effect that is talked a lot recently for Earth's atmosphere because uh, it warms up as it creates climate change. So on Mars, it happens with CO2 on slightly kind of smaller scale. Uh, sun uh, energy penetrates through the layer of CO2 and hits at the bottom where it can actually warm up this, the surface of Mars itself, which is now covered by the CO2 layer. And it rises temperature and CO2 starts to sublime. It builds up pressure for a bit until the ice cannot hold it anymore. The ice breaks and that gas rushes out and that's what creates kind of a geyser structure. So we call them jets because um, Earth geologists insist that the geyser is something related to water in the cavity and there is no water. It's not involved in that on Mars. It's really the cold gas and that's why we call them jets. And then atmospheric people complain that the jets is something different, but anyway, <laughs> so that's <laughs> the different part. Um, yeah, so these jets, they bring up some of the material from underneath. They just pick up stuff on the way and they deposit it then on top of that layer that they just broke through. So what we see when we observe uh, those areas in early spring is that these deposits appear everywhere. And then when time goes by and the CO2 sublimes away completely, it becomes warm and-, and Really something. quick, just to be clear, when you say sublime, what do you mean by that? When you say the CO2 sublimes, what yes. is that? Thank you. Sublimes is because as I mentioned, CO2 cannot be, uh, can be only as ice or gas. So when you warm it up, it directly goes into gas. 
So it doesn't. Perfect. So it's ice melting into gas, so to speak, skipping the liquid phase altogether. Yes. Okay. So Perfect. it's we don't call it melting. Right. The correct. Right. Joe is then sublime. Sure. You see here in Colorado, sometimes water does that. It gets warmed up and it actually doesn't melt. The, this, well, sorry, the snow gets warmed up and it doesn't melt. It directly goes into vapor and it disappears on the hot spring day after snowfall. That's very often what happens. <laughs> yeah, so where was I? On the, yeah, on the observation, I think. So, so once in the spring, once those the uh, deposits start to sublimate into the gas, yeah. So when that happens, then these fans that we see very nicely in first as a contrast between like bright ice and deposits that was put there that are having some dirt and dust and regolith brought up, and uh, yeah, so they slowly vanish because the contrast between ice and this dark material vanishes. So that's what we observe with uh, uh, remote sensing techniques on Mars. Uh, started from um, uh, or Mars Orbiter Camera. <laughs> but so the mock was uh, on Mars Global Surveyor. And the mock team was first who noticed those things, but they didn't have observations enough to say that these fans are seasonal. So they saw the, the permanent features. And then we got high-res camera, high resolution imaging science experiment on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And uh, now with the better data rates and also more focused on observing actually these features, uh, we see that these fans come and go every year. So they appear every year in spring, they disappear towards summer, and in next spring they come out again. They are different, at slightly different locations, differently maybe oriented a bit, um, but repeatedly over now seven Martian years, we observe them. So this is a long introduction as a background to story of what we are doing at planet four so the the idea is that these jets they come out and their their direction is controlled by wind when when they are blown in the sky uh, into the atmosphere uh, but the other information is the the resolution of the high res camera is so large that the images are one gigabyte size and they can be uh, up to 20 by hundred thousand pixels large one image only. So uh, to make a precise catalog of all these things and, and which direction they uh, are deposited uh, was just a too large task. And that's how we uh, had the idea. Why, why not uh, let uh, citizen science help us there? So uh, I don't know if we're already bridging into maybe your next question is like, how did it all get started? But that's basically What's the scenario? The high-res data is just too large and we needed the help of citizen science. Yeah, we did start with uh, some students, get, mm -hmm. got them a task to, you know, count these fans on this location, but then it's, it's just too boring task. There yeah. are too many, so we didn't really want to bore our students to death with that. So when uh, opportunity presented itself in form of one of our other colleagues that did this with us, Mech Schwamb, uh, when, when she basically came up and said, guys, can you do something about Mars for citizen science? We were like, yes, sure. Just to be clear, how just how many fans are we talking in one of these images, roughly? Thousands. Yeah, it can be up to thousands within one. Wow. Image. Yeah, it's a lot. Yes. Yeah, and we have by now hundreds of high-rise images that we would like to run through this. Of course, we are not there yet, so we didn't sure. go through all of them. It's work in progress, and I think there is still quite some data that we. So if there are. 
potentially thousands of fans per image and you have hundreds of images that is to say that there are still hundreds of thousands of uncatalogued fans going and they're just sitting somewhere in some database that's crazy yeah yeah well that's we nuts. our our project finished 220 images of two years and we have I think three to 400 still waiting to be analyzed. And uh, it's a lot of work. And it, even the citizen science scientists, which we have in total over 30,000 30, different people were helping us, uh, but with a core team of much less than that. So many people just do one or two. But um, there's, yeah, there's, as you said, there's still much more data to analyze. And we, we, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the idea is really that the work is being made easier by combining the stuff with machine learning pre-filtering so that we don't give empty data to citizen scientists and things like that so that our, our efficiency over time will be increased and the citizens will be less bored and make really only the interesting tasks so you're basically running it through sort of an ai filter to make sure yes there are some fans and jets in this thing before you actually send it on to somebody yeah, I mean, it can be actually maybe AI is even too much said, but um, we, we can at least train the AI in a, in a way that says if there is dark stuff on bright backgrounds, then the contrast function is much higher, much larger than if it's just bland background with no jets. So we can at least make some kind of uh, assured decision that this data should be empty and we shouldn't bother the scientists with that. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, mention another factor on why citizen science actually, I think dominates over the single focused scientists and, and poor grad students work that is doing this work, which is fatigue. Because fatigue creates a nonlinear uh, uncertainty in, the, in your data results when, because after 10,000 objects, you're just tired of making it and you become less precise mm -hmm. and, and annoyed by the tasks. And our, our uh, uh, advantage here is that all the eyes that look in our data are mostly fresh. They might be untrained, but they're all fresh. And the advantage is that we have 30 different people looking at the same data, and I'm taking the average in our pipeline through that. So even the untrained eye uh, make that 30 times, uh, the average signal of that is a good result. And that, that fascinating mathematical uh, a fact that I just described in words is called the wisdom of the crowd, and it has relate, uh, it's related to Gaussian functions. That uh, um, and um, my favorite example story of this is show show hundred people a glass with marbles in there and let them estimate how many marbles are in there. And the amazing, mind blowing thing is that the average will be correct. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. So what sort of sort of tasks are these people doing? Are they just identifying the jets? Are they taking more information? And how much sort of pre-knowledge do they have to have coming into this? Do they need any sort of education before just jumping in on this? No, not at all. We actually have a tutorial where yeah, it's shown to you what kind of things, how they look like. And then um, our major two, two, we have uh, different graphical tools on this website. And the major ones are the fan and the blotch. And I don't know if, uh, I forgot if Anya mentioned that already, but if there's no fan during the eruption, then there's no designated direction of these deposits. So then they look like blotchy, elliptic or circular. Yeah, so for that- fall out like a fountain around. Yeah, it. imagine it's being spit up and then falls down like a cloud. So, and, and then has no significant direction and that we call a blotch. And that is also information for us because that means that at that time of the eruption, there was no clear wind direction. Either was the wind too weak or was too chaotic. No, most likely we think it was not weak. So uh, cha cha chaotic wind direction, that's another topic actually for science analysis we might want to speak later about. But, but yeah, blotches are no winds and fans are winds. So, and these tools are being introduced in the tutorial, uh, uh, how you place first the marker and how you drag the thing, and then you correct it, shift it, and rotate the symbol that you, draw, uh, you, that you have drawn on your monitor. And, and that's it. You do that for all objects that you can identify per, per tile. Uh, what we should mention is all these gigantic high-res images, they are cut into smaller tiles so that they fit nicely on a laptop screen or window screen of your uh, standard uh, monitor. So that you iPad. can focus 
Oh yeah, uh, so that you can focus on the small tile. Uh, and that obviously no single person is overwhelmed by a gigantic task of having 100,000 pixels to do. Mm -hmm. So actually each pixel, it's roughly 860 pi by 600, something like that, uh, pixels to do. And there might be, and even this small thing, you know, if you're unlucky, there might be over 100 fans in there and you have to all mark them. And that's a painful task, but and we're very thankful to all the citizens who are going through that effort but it gives us for this small tile uh, the the wind directions and that's really cool and we can then go zoom out again for the high-res image and have different areas in the high-res images will actually have different wind directions caused by the topography topography the different uh, undulations of the inclinations of the martian surface they will create different wind directions and we can see these if we have co2 jets erupting there I mean, uh, one side question of our science always is why actually a certain area has jets erupting and the other one not. We're not really sure if we can answer this with a citizen science project because that's actually focusing more on making use out of the existing ones. But we have actually other parallel projects that map fields where at all we have spiders and fans erupting at all. These are the sister projects that we developed uh, afterwards, which is called Planet for terrains and planet for ridges that's another use case where uh, more geology oriented scientists from JPL Laura Kerber is uh, using the same uh, kind of mapping tools but not with high risk data but with CDX data a little bit lower resolution and looking other at other features so the idea of really doing Martian surface based analysis with the with good quality images and using citizen science for that really pa uh, paid out and uh, it's depending on the amount of detail you're asking for, if that's a faster task to do or a slower one. For, for a funny anecdote, for example, is that the sister project that was created later overtook me in the analysis pipeline and published earlier because their task was not in the detail, but it was just marking if a certain kind of topographical feature is visible in the tile or not. So the scientists were able to go very fast through, they only had to decide between five and six things. And these were basically five or six flags and the data at the end, so much easier to analyze as well. While I had to go in and make geometrical yeah, uh, averages of all the moment. objects. Yes. Let's backpedal a little bit because I think we missed to say that when citizen scientists mark the fan deposits or the blodge deposits, we record all the geometric information about those markings. Mm -hmm. So they have the size, they have the orientation, they have the position in the image. And imagine that everybody does it and every time is slightly different. So we have 30 markings of the same object and we have to combine them into one because that's what exactly happens, the wisdom of the crowd. The average object of all those markings will be what we actually see. And Michael wrote the pipeline that does that the, what we call it clustering so it's uh, it takes all this many many uh, markings with all those detailed information and it runs cleans it up and removes the some people that decided to have fun and draw something different than the fans that's all happens automatically and that was a big big task that Michael had uh, taken and did actually and yeah, and at the end we have uh, wisdom of the crowd markings for all our fans over the image or, and blotches. So that and that kind of separate. And then we create catalogs of them. So list all of them, list their sizes, their locations, their directions. And that is the data that then I am actually working with. So doing a statistical analysis of them like currently we are finishing up the paper where we are comparing them with the models of atmospheric dynamics on Mars. So how wind behaves from people who actually can model them. Like, like you know, our prediction of the weather, similar thing on Mars. Uh, and it's a tough task because we have very few information about it. But yeah, we are trying to correlate how well they are doing, for example. So. There is a lot of steps between actually creating the project, 
getting the information from people who Mark can help us and then doing science. So there is each of these tasks is a bunch of subtasks and yeah, we sometimes getting lost in them as well. Sure. So, well, to go back just as a tad, you mentioned that sometimes people, for whatever reason, you know, think it's funny to to report information that's not accurate, right? So they draw some other thing on this image or whatever. That's one example, and it sounds like you've kind of found a way to flush those those you know instances out. But what other drawbacks are there to having citizens do this kind of science? Are there you know things that you have to watch out for or kind of plan ahead for? Uh, when you're having these yeah. people that don't have a formal science education, uh, you know, do the science with you guys? Of course there are. And uh, we always say we were very naive when we came into this project at the beginning. We were very excited and uh, thought that it's all very easy. And it took us, I don't know, three, four times longer than we first actually thought it would take. <laughs> so... You have to be a little bit uh, psychologist in doing these kind of things. Luckily, we were not the first. So um, Galaxy Zoo was the first project on this platform. And then there were planet hunters as well. So people already collected some kind of uh, information about how you do this most efficient. And it's uh, interesting, it was interesting to me that sometimes I would say basically the wrong thing to do. Uh, I remember how we first thought, why don't we give people some kind of virtual prizes, like a medal of marking a lot of things and so on. And we were like stopped by the uh, person who already went through that and said, you know, that messes up everything. People some people really want to earn these badges and they just do not very good jobs. They try to rush through the, their markings. They, I don't know, try to fiddle with it. So don't do that. Um, th th that was one example. Yeah, but the people who uh, kind of having fun around, they don't bother as much because this wisdom of the crowd, if you are really doing something absolutely crazy, nobody else has repeated, that will not be counted. Michael's pipeline will just throw that away. Um, I think the biggest lesson that we learned that we actually went very ambitious. Our uh, whole process with markings and having two different objects and having them placed randomly in the image, it's complex. And it was complex for us to analyze, not so much for uh, people to mark, but for us to analyze, that took a long time. So now when we are trying to make new projects, like what Michael mentioned, the uh, terrains and so on, we're trying to simplify it. Like, sorry, the simpler you go, the easier your life will be afterwards uh, so mm -hmm. that's that's definitely the big uh big lesson for us but i also think that being so ambitious we are also very special there is probably no other project that does this much of post-production and the data well i i think uh, part of what you said crystallizes in the following trade-off that people should think about when they make this kind of project idea, which is the complexity of the analysis uh, setup and the uh, pipeline afterwards, compared to the effort of uh, doing it without citizen science, right? So if your data is large and a lot, so specifically if you have a lot of data that points towards citizen science, so then, like Anya said, if you can make the task simple, that also points to citizen science. However, if your question on the data is very complex and it needs to be answered with graphical tools like we did on Planet 4, where people need to draw a complex shape, 
the more complex things are done as a measurement by the citizen science, the more complex your whole analysis pipeline will be. And it really, it, it's exponentially growing in time to make that clean and understanding the errors that can happen, the more complex task the scientists are doing this so. So the problem is totally not the ability of citizen science to draw complex shape. Really the complexity is, is I'm having 30 people or 10 or 15 people doing that. And what do I do with these measurements? I have these complex shapes now, how do I combine them? It's like, there are no simple polygon merging tools that know what they're doing. I mean, uh, this is really a problem specific task on how you merge differently drawn polygons for whatever reason, because some person thought the contrast ends here, the object ends here, or it starts there, or it's in general, it was a low contrast image and it's just very hard to decipher where the object starts and where it ends. So all these kind, these are these error statements that we are we're fighting with in our uh, Planet Fork analysis pipeline. So like Anja said, if you can, if you have a lot of data and you can boil down the question to something like, hey, I have a hypo hypothesis of five different things that might be visible in this image. I don't know what, can you click which of the things you see? And that will be maybe introduced in a tutorial. You know, these things look like that. Do you see this in this image? And our visual cortex of human beings is just so cool in pattern recognition, still much faster without training even. Actually, we are being trained all over, over the life. That's why our cortex works so well. Uh, but to make this task, it's just so much faster than uh, machine learning where you still need to tell the machine, what does it mean to see things and what are these patterns and now go and analyze them, right? So it's just really a fascinating approach of mixture. And I don't see any real negatives apart from this work trade-off that you need to do. How much time and money you have, how much workforce and how complex is your question that you want to ask the data? Yeah. So you mentioned that you, you know, with, with machine learning, if you have enough data that's already been uh, uh, analyzed, you can then train, you know, some recognition program to say, okay, well, now I'm going to look at this image, right? I'm the program. I'm going to look at this image. And now I can tell you what you were asking me before. Do you think that, you know, there's some boundary where, you know, on the easier side, you could just write a machine learning application to do that work for you or is computation not yet at the point where you can trust that for scientific accuracy and it's still really beneficial to have human people looking at those images and giving you the results instead of a computer human people as opposed to other kind of people <laughs> yeah, that, okay fair just human just people yeah yeah <laughs> um virtual but, people i guess <laughs> but yeah that's it's a good lead into what's currently actually going on so we have our two-year catalog and uh, a machine learning group from Australia actually approached us to see what they can learn, do with this catalog. And if they cannot teach uh, um, a neural network uh, to, to analyze this stuff. And we're about to publish our first paper that basically says that the simple approaches don't work. So uh, in simple approaches of machine learning, the human always wins. So, so basically our catalog is better and more efficient and proficient uh, in terms of the specific specificity of uh, how good the results are. And, uh, but uh, we're talking about the forefront of machine learning, specifically convolutional uh, neural networks that are focusing on image analysis. And there when you have, uh, because uh, if you go back on what we actually do, we mark these fans with different direction and sizes. So what, we, what you need to train the network is to realize that this is the same shape depend independent of its rotation in the image and independent of its size. So this is this is a current top notch machine learning. I mean, it's it's done by some specific companies and military and police, of course, for quite a while. But in the private and science sector, this is still top notch, uh, very new to have uh, objects identified independent of their orientation and their size. So the ideal approach currently for me is. You, let, you have for sure a citizen science program running to mark the data, what we call label the data in machine learning. And then with that labeled data, you are gonna train in your network and then you apply that on even more data. As I said before, the tasks of citizens is so complicated and let's say complicated, not time consuming. 
if there's 50 to 100 fans, it just takes so long. So we, we don't want to waste the human potential here and maybe go on to other programs and projects. So what we want to do is let uh, uh, label data for us that we can then use for machine learning tasks to then expand uh, by, by after this training phase, expand the applicability of this uh, to even much more data and much more faster than after we have trained the neural network. So it's a cool combination. It's a real good combo because all good machine learning, you know, there's these two branches of machine learning, unsupervised and supervised. And supervised is, needs labels. And the labels come usually from humans or from the really, really good uh, math analysis algorithms, but the easier one is it comes from humans. So the currently the best results for machine learning stuff is always this supervised branch where you have a lot of labels and the good old philosophy is the more labels you have, the better your results are. So that's how I say uh, citizen science will stay very important for quite some time because we need these labels to then train the machine learning networks and then to apply to even more data because our data is actually growing much faster all the time because of our telemetry capability uh, increasing all the time. So one thing that I wanted to ask too is, um, as far as the project goes, are you collecting any sort of like demographic data on these people that are volunteering? Like, do you know who is, is working on these fans? Do you know if they're students or other scientists or just random folks? So officially we don't record anything, so. <laughs> Like, like we are not tracing people or anything like that. Yeah, so let me just mention that the, the whole website, Zooniverse, actually has very strict rules on that. So the IT people have access to all the data, but the scientists actually get a reduced amount of data catalog that is not anonymized, but it for sure doesn't have uh, simply data like IP addresses and things like that. We can make a request on it to do a social study on things like that, but this is all then actually involving other people that are uh, watching the ethics aspect of that. So we're so it's not as simple as that. But having mm -hmm. said that, we have a talk. So it's basically a forum, the part of the uh, web page that let people interact and discuss things. And there are topics where people introduce themselves. So we know a little bit of who are excited about it enough that they go on the talk and try to talk to us or ask us questions or things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have really spectrum of people from young and uh, space excited folks to retired geologists who always wanted to work on Mars instead of Earth or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, we had, uh, I don't know if it's still running, but we had several um, projects with schools where teachers used this tool as a science project for their students. So we got a lot of uh, input from, yeah, from school from kids who were learning that. Um, yeah, but I don't think that there is a specific uh, type of people to name here. We really have everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what, what I wanted to mention, and I just got reminded, I don't know if it was the retired geologist, but uh, one thing uh, uh, what I want to mention is that the people that are really dedicating a lot of time to, and you see them in the forums and so on, they're, they're then being nominated as moderators. So they help us to, to tell the newbies uh, what's the task and what to do. And, and you know, and, what, and then if some, some questions pop up, they cannot answer, they ping us so that we join the forum and things like that. So they're really helpful, uh, these dedicated individuals. And we have this subgroup of 15 to 20 people who did the majority of the work actually. They went through thousands and thousands of tiles. Um, and the other cool thing I wanted to mention, uh, because it could be serving as a motivation to others, this has a real effect on real-time operations on satellites. Because we had once a low-resolution image where citizen science pointed out to us something funny looking. And we, because it was a low-resolution image, we were not sure what we saw in the image. So we programmed the high-rise camera uh, the, lead, the science lead of our team is Candy Hansen from the MRO high-rise camera. So she uh, 
planned a new target uh, re-observation of the same area with a higher resolution. And uh, just to confirm that there's not something really funny going on. And it was not really bizarre, but it was not decipherable in the lower resolution image. And for example, that was a real effect on, on ongoing data taking that the citizen science project had on the operations. Yeah, our daughter project, uh, Planet for Terrains, where we also use lower, not high rise, but the lower resolution data from CTX. Uh, there, we actually aimed to find new locations with specific features. And mm -hmm. then we pointed high rise to take image of that. So that, that's even more straightforward. You know, that was our aim. Uh, tell us if you think this is the place where we can point the camera next time. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like one of these, you know, kind of surprising things that comes up is, oh, hey, someone's pointed out this interesting thing and we actually aren't sure about what that is. What are there other examples of surprises that have occurred, you know, while you're doing this, this project? Are there other things that come up where you're like, wow, interesting. We didn't think about that or, you know, other things that were just kind of unexpected when you when you work on this. I think Anya, some of your statistical results. I mean, uh, one example can I can do before you start maybe, but I think you had some interesting statistical stuff. I mean, for the wind directions, for example, when when do these directions appear, reappear or change over time? So that's what Anya focused on. But what I, for example, can say is simply the statistics of how many of which size of fans we have, you know? Um, that you cannot answer if you just look at the image. Yeah, there's a lot of smaller fans, but here we have very lot, a lot of larger fans. And if you don't go through everything, you don't know what's the relationship with us. So the, the really cool result is that you've at the end, uh, maybe it was not so, it was not uh, so much a surprise, but more like the final understanding. Ah, that's the distribution of the sizes and the energies. So, uh, for example, I can say that 90% of all the fans are below 100 meters. But then we have this 10% that are larger than 100 meters. And the th interesting thing is that previous work that tried to simulate the gas dynamics of this and so on cannot explain the larger ones. There's because these models were uh, using simplified gas dynamics. So we try to get funding for making it better. But yeah, these older works were trying the first uh, direct simple approach of modeling this all, and it cannot serve to explain all of these fans. So basically, we now have a quantitative statement that yes, we understand 90% of the stuff, but 10% we still need to understand better. And uh, Anya, I think uh, some of your wind directions uh, were a bit surprising, right? When it appears um, what? Actually, we had to change our our own understanding several times about what's happening. And I think one maybe most uh, obvious was is that we still don't know when exactly the fans are erupting because we have basically image once in a couple of weeks. And we see the changes and we know from theoretical considerations that they correlated to the amount of sunlight that the area gets. And what we corrected definitely between the beginning of this project and now is that in the beginning we thought, oh, all of these uh, fans erupt very early in the morning in early spring, you no, know, just sun comes up and that's when everything happens. And uh, I don't know, that was a little bit, again, naive and maybe even stupid from our side because uh, trying to correlate it with the wind, we noticed the uh, common correlation in many areas that it correlates to winds more like in the afternoon, lunchtime afternoon. And then we will coming back to the drawing board and thinking, but yeah, sure, we need some time to accumulate the pressure and to break. So the most of the solar radiation that's during the day is absorbed there will be around lunchtime. And then anytime after that, it should erupt because that's when it's overburdened the uh, ice. So that was one that we definitely shifted in our understanding and it's 
again, maybe not surprising if would be if we would be smarter and thought about it beforehand, but we didn't. <laughs> well, I, I think we're still this, right? dis discussing. Uh, I, I just want to push back a little bit there, defending the Planet 4 results, because uh, uh, at some points, the modeling of the weather dynamics is also so complex that we could also say, maybe there's a balance of where we are right and the modeling is wrong, right? So you have to be careful. Uh, it's, it's just because, uh, like Anya mentioned, uh, the problem of all weather dynamics uh, simulations on Mars is the lack of measurement points where you anchor the simulation to reality. If you don't have wind measurements, temperature measurements on a grid on the surface of Mars, all your simulations are free floating in math space and you need to notch them to match reality. You just don't know where they really are. So, and that was a, a difficulty at the beginning where maybe we always push back too much to the simulation until the simulator really made a, a good case for arguing, okay, there's the energy here and the winds are there developing there. So yes, I also tend to believe now that they are uh, erupting maybe more towards the afternoon than early morning. But um, uh, I, I just want to point out that we need to do some modeling work of the jets and, and try to get funding for it. So any private citizens should talk to the Senator to fund us <laughs> um, uh, that, uh, so that we make, can make more use, better, more precise use out of these data sets because if we would know when the jets precisely erupt, we would basically have a mini weather station on the Mars surface. Because we could then tell the simulator, I know the jet erupts at four o'clock, so you better tune your simulations so that that wind matches. As long as we don't know precisely when they erupt, we have this constant battle where maybe one party says we are correct or the other one says we are correct, right? So it's, it's, it's yeah, just the lack of knowledge. And another part is that uh, we didn't mention so far, but we never saw this jets in action. We oh, only yes. see mm -hmm. the deposits that we mark. And big part of that is actually pointing the camera there at the right moment, because it's probably erupt, I don't know, minutes maximum, several minutes, because how maybe long seconds. do you, maybe seconds, how long do you take to empty a cavity like geysers do right so uh we really think that we never on the right time imaging it connected to that most of the orbits of spacecraft are fixed on one time so they always observe at the same time but we're slowly starting to get those satellites that actually image at different times of days like the uh, trace, trace gas orbiter from europe they have also not completely free, but more variability in local time imaging. And uh, Emirates mission also will have that, but they don't have a good time. They're, <laughs> anyway. they're also further away, but yes. yeah, but the, but the trace gas orbiter was a, was a good start. Uh, and this is the difference between polar orbit versus equatorial orbit. The equatorial orbit, if it flies around the equator with some oscillations, it sees just all the local times. And the polar orbit is always at the same local time, which is why from a polar orbit mission, we wouldn't be able to scan different times of the day to check, hmm, did the jets erupt already or not? So that's not possible with a polar yeah, orbit. Yeah, but we, we also so far didn't have a good argument on, you know, if we would know when exactly they erupt, we could try to convince people to shift the orbit or do something about it. But if we don't know, yeah. No argument well, to make. Yeah, on top of that, there's a risk because we actually don't know if they are easily observable. It could be that the dust cloud that is nicely visible uh, by cumulative deposition on the surface on the bright eyes, that's clearly dark. But while in air, it might be too thin. And that's another thing where we didn't have the funding for yet to do the simulation to calculate with radiative transfer, how, how well is a jet visible if it's currently erupted? And as long as we cannot persuade a whole mission uh, that is really the case, they don't spend the fuel to change the orbit just for us. So. Are, are you making these data sets available for other people to come and use for different projects? Or you're not just hoarding all of this tons and tons and tons of data? No, no. no. It's, it's freely available. It's uh, basically attached to our paper for this first two years that we 
already on analyzed uh and we could we plan to continue doing that yeah well. let me specify that even both kinds of data is available and with both i mean the end result of a catalog that gives you the location size parameters uh for both fans and blotches but also the pre-stage of that uh, meaning the measurements of the citizens is also available. They are, of course, much, much larger files. But in case you want to redo my pipeline, if you feel so inclined, then you can do that. I think you should do it, Tara. I think that you should uh, double check every, <laughs> this whole project's work. <laughs> check the data, rebuild the pipeline, then you can come back and say, hey, here's here's how it's going down. <laughs> Yeah, we'll actually, talk more uh, about that funding option later. <laughs> yeah, right, right, <laughs> right, right. But uh, we we wrote an over fifty page paper that uh, details every step of it, so you can actually go in there and, and redo it. So it sounds like this could also be, you know, in addition to to the the uh, geological science, it sounds like there's also a hefty amount of computer science going on, right? Which is, you know, pretty standard, I think, today for astronomy but it, it, are you saying that that paper details the way that you are you know getting from from when someone you know draws the shape on their screen to when it you know goes through the couple of filters to make sure that it's real or whatever and then it goes into you know how are we averaging all of these out so that we get that that uh what was the name for that the crowd uh that the wisdom of the crowd the wisdom of the crowd and then you yeah. you know use that to then make your conclusions it sounds like you know th that all of that intermediate stuff is just computer processing and that's a, a, a big part of the project yes yes and that's uh, indeed all described in the paper which is why it took took quite a while i mean sure. because uh, sure. we were actually uh, like anya said we were a little bit too naive and groundbreaking in this way because nobody did such a detailed surface geometry feature analysis on a citizen science basis with hundred thousand users Right. You know, um, so nobody did that. So um, that's why it was good to just keep track of all the decisions we had to make and clean up the data and combine the data so that the uh, the believability of the end result basically is higher. You know, it's like the reproducibility and so right. on. And uh, our reviews agreed that they thought it's a fantastic idea. Um, and yeah, so I think uh, it's 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 really a cool project in general. When all is said and done, would you say that it was worth the the time that it took to build this pipeline, or would it have been a better use of time, like you were kind of talking about earlier, to just have scientists, you know, people with formal science educations, work on this, and then you did you could skip that whole pipeline step altogether, and hmm. or maybe you know shorten it drastically. So my personal opinion would be, for us as a team, it might ha not have been worth it. I have to be honest there because of the time investment. For okay. the global society, let's say for the greater society and for the greater good, it was worth it because these tasks are necessary, they need to be done, and we should have just had more funding for it. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, or more people, uh, right. or more people that are were already knowledgeable with parts of these kind of things of operations. So, I mean, it's worth, uh, it's worth for us in terms of the result but in terms of the investment of time over over everything it was very costly on us i right. think and we could have we we maybe could have had results faster focusing on less areas you know now our catalog is covering how many regions anya 27. 14 what no, how many 20, 27. 27 different regions on the south pole had we focused maybe on 10 maybe we could have done a good job for some of these regions now we have a lot of coverage and basically we're able to do compare these if a simulator can produce as many simulations in high detail at different locations we we can compare these at so many locations so i think uh, like i said in the greater good i think it was worth doing it it's just sure. was, was very costly for our team in terms yeah. of time yeah you're I, ending up with sort of two products out of this you have your data catalog that you're getting but you also have this pipeline that you've built that could then be used for other projects or retrofitted for different things so you're really coming out of it with with two end products well experience is always a good thing to have yeah sure Three. <laughs> that's true yeah it's true and uh and there's actually quite some demand on uh scientists wanting to upload 
a new science, uh, a citizen science project, and I have a pipeline for CTX data, which is much simpler. Well, not much simpler, but smaller than high rise data. So people would like to have something where they can just say, I pick these images, now your pipeline runs, and they will be uploaded uh, to this universe project, right? Or to some kind of citizen science project. And I need to publish that, uh, so that so that people can easier follow it. But yeah, that's something that some people have asked me if, if this can be available as, so this is a different pipeline. But yeah, it's an increasing demand because people realize the CDX data, even though it's lower resolution, they make larger images, right? So, so their, their product spans more of the Martian surface while high res is a detailed focusing instrument. So you can answer a lot of questions with CTX. It's a beautiful data set and a very well calibrated camera. Um, so, so working with CTX, you can learn a lot about Mars, uh, so, but because the data is itself still large in terms of pixels, um, citizen science is a great help there as well. So yeah, if anybody wants to start a new CTX based project, just let us know. And uh, it gives me more motivation to finally publish that paper. <laughs> Well, I kind of tend to slightly disagree with Michael that it wasn't worse for us. I think that we uh, exactly gaining all this experience and uh, actually making use of the uh, data that we otherwise wouldn't mark. It's, it's, it's a big thing. For example, it's a very rare uh, measurement of wind directions and strengths we can pull out of that. Uh, in the polar regions, well, actually anywhere on, on Mars. We have very few information about actual winds. There's a couple from rovers where it was even not always successful, like uh, one of three directions didn't work or things like this. Uh, so I think it scientifically was worse for us. It took a long time and it was a yeah, demanding project, but at the end, we get in the very unique results. And I like the idea that individual people are actually helping to contribute to all of this. I think that's the big yep. draw of citizen science, that people just want to be involved and they like helping out. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually guys... amazes me until now that people actually want to invest their time, spare time. They can go and watch a movie instead. They go and help us mark this fence. This is fantastic. I, I mean, every time I'm surprised seeing the numbers on the Planet 4 webpage, how many people are interested. Yeah, and we are actually making, we are definitely making our moderators the course or so on our papers. And we are like always thinking and mentioning people for the, for, for their help because yeah, it's time, time is money. They giving us money in a way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you noticed any uptick in your participation since the, the COVID shutdown? Are more people logging on and spending time now that a lot of more people have more time to spend? Good question. I don't think we did look at that. No, it's, uh, yeah, it was a bit uh, subdued by our own worries about setting up our offices, I think. What we realized, we had one more interview at some point and interviews in, in public space. For example, we had one with uh, uh, NPR. Uh, there was a science program, uh, you know, Science Fridays, I think it's called on NPR. And uh, we were on that. And then you always see upticks that are really helpful because people hear about it, they log in. And uh, I don't know if your program will have some kind of uh, website with links and so on, but planet4.org. Uh, where you will find every our project and our sister project as well. You can just go on there, make an account, and, and help us out there. It's planet4.space now. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. We, that we changed that. spelled out F-O-U-R, not the number four, or is it the number four? F no, F4 it's uh, spelled out, yeah. Okay. And it's, uh, Anya's right. We, we made the new mother website that's dot .space, planet4.space. Yeah. And then you see all our daughter projects as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to mention that there was this hiatus where we didn't have actually Planet 4 in the beginning of the COVID. Oh, Remember, that's right. Remember, we relaunched it. 
because yeah because we changed the back end and it kind of overlapped with the beginning of all this global trouble uh yeah but now it's up and running and yeah. oh let me mention this back end story because that's actually fascinating the back end was developed for the idea to reduce the load on IT people because uh, our original project was done completely on the control of IT people that need to needed to hand generate the tools that didn't exist before like Anya said we were very demanding at the beginning uh, making these measurements that were not done in that kind of detail before then they realized there's a lot of overlap between the projects that are asking for the similar things so they came up with a whole new backend of make how zooniverse should run and uh, with the end result that you can actually set up on your own without IT support, a new citizen science project. It's all instructed with example projects and you don't need IT people anymore. The backend is so powerful that you basically load up the images yourself or using Python scripts or manual dragging into a file explorer on the website. You design the questions, you design the flow of the questions meaning there can be yes, no, depending on which kind of next question is appearing. And uh, yeah, that way anybody in the world can create a new citizen science project if they have a data set they want, uh, they want a question. And that was inspired by the, the pipeline that you built for Planet 4? Or is that just something that Zooniverse was working on that they said, hey, we, need, we should create this yes. that's powerful enough that you don't need IT people? Yeah, exactly. I think Zooniverse was the oldest, sorry, Galaxy Zoo was the oldest project. And I'm always in awe of them because you have to consider they were doing something in the beginning and everybody was criticizing and saying, how can you have uh, uh, citizens, uneducated citizens working on this? What do you expect from that? And what's the result of Galaxy Zoo? Over 50 published papers and a reclassification of the galaxy identification scheme with a value shift between elliptical and spiral galaxies. We have changed our view of the universe thanks to this citizen science project. So it's this is amazing impact. That is pretty cool that people were kind of scoffing at it and now they're like, hey, look at how much this did. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. awesome. That's yeah. a really cool kind of takeaway. So mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, Zooniverse is making it easy for, for people like yourselves to set up these projects. What other advice would you to give to other scientists, say, that are listening to this and thinking, man, I should harness the power of the people and set up my own citizen science project. Do you have any pointers? Absolutely. First, <laughs> think it through. <laughs> Not go like we did, like, let's just make them mark things. Like, you have to... Uh, really lay out uh, what your scientific question that you're trying to answer, which data you actually trying to collect, and then how the easiest would be to get to that point. Because uh, yeah, you can simplify the question you're asking in citizen science, or you can make that more challenging uh, and maybe simplify your post-production pipelines. So this is, I think, the biggest, the toughest part of setting up the actual project like that, because the technical part uh, on one side is not infinitely variable. There is a restricted set of questions that you can ask. Is the thing that we are searching for in the image? Uh, do you see it increasing or decreasing in the plot? So there are not million of different questions that you can ask. There is a defined set or like restricted set. Uh, so trying to combine that into the simplest way possible is would be my advice for sure, because yeah, otherwise you're spending unnecessary time on that. Of course, as usual, talk to people who already went through that. Ask mm -hmm. if this idea would work. Because I, until now, run into this point. Like, I'm like, oh, let's do that. And then the programmer comes down and says, no, this is way too complex. We can't do that. So, and it still needs some patience, I think, because it still takes time, even with thousands of people until you 
gain that statistical number of people who looked at your image, it still takes time. So it's not like, you know, tomorrow. You need to wait for a bit. So be patient, that's another one. Right. Yeah, I always saw, say in my presentations uh, to any supervisor that thinks he can set up a master's or undergrad student and do a little bit of citizen science in a month or so. Don't do that because that's <laughs> impossible. It's literally impossible to do good citizen science from the beginning to the end is a one year full time master science project. Uh, that's my minimum. I would do this. You can, of course, do an undergrad in analyzing data that already exists. But if we're talking about setting up a new project, you have to think about it really in terms of you have to create two pipelines. You have to do an ingestion pipeline that takes the data and manipulates it in a way that it best works for the citizens for the given question. That might be false color, you know, to improve some contrast for something, or uh, you have to really think something simple question of how many pixels do you show that depends on you know what objects you are actually hunting for is the object larger then you need to zoom out or is the object more detailed do you have the signal to noise ratio things like that so that's the ingestion pipeline and then by the way you can do things like wrong that we i think uh, did a few times you need to keep track oh first of all you need to anonymize your science data because what you actually don't want to do is the clever citizen who realizes, oh, this is high-risk observation with that ID. Let me look it up and see what it actually is and where it is pointing to. And then you have what we called bias data, because then the people are marking things with a certain you know, mental bias where they already know, oh, this was taken in winter, this was taken in spring. So I guess this, this is ice, this is not ice. We don't want that influence because then you don't have, you don't have the same status for everybody who's marking. We need it to be all unbiased so that we can then later on say, okay, that's how the visual interpretation was happening. So that this is the thing. So how do you do that? You need to separate the uh, scientific observations from how you call this object in the pipeline, meaning you have to keep track of everything. You need to have two different spreadsheets, one of the incoming and one of the outgoing thing. And then you have a link item that you never should lose track. Otherwise your whole data taking wasn't for nothing. You wouldn't know what this object was being related to which science observation. So this is all we need to think about for the ingestion pipeline only. And that's part of the, the thing I wanted to publish for the CTX thing. For the, and then you know, like Anya said, you should really practice full circle. And that wasn't possible for us easily because the IT people, we needed to ask the IT people to give us the data back from test observations or from some size uh, citizen scientists that already were looking at it. Now with this new backend, you actually can click a button and say, give me a data dump and you are allowed to do one per day. So uh, just because of data saving. Uh, so you don't need anybody. You can practice on your own the, the whole circle and then you need to write the analysis pipeline. So basically that's the second part. With this, all these weird measurements and all the extra web data that you maybe don't want and you need to write a filter to not see all this extra, what web browser it was here, maybe you don't care and most likely you don't care, but this all comes back to you, you know, in case you do care. Some people maybe do care. And so that is the analysis pipeline and you need to practice really, can you get to your question that you have initially with all your data, the way you take it? And sometimes then we you have a, a very simple thing like, should we ask or should we force the citizen to now make a decision if there is data there or not could influence the whole result in there in terms of making psychologically tricky, make the citizen science really do some drawing or not, or think that the task is done or not. So there is a little bit of like Anya said, a psychological moment there that you need to practice in terms of what what is happening in terms of a, an unbeknownst user that is looking at your data for the first time and the zooniverse project has published paper on the psychology of citizen science which is uh, kind of an interesting aspect on the whole story but yeah uh, don't underestimate the work as i said roughly speaking it's it's a one year full time work from starting from scratch another thing that uh, I want I want to mention here. You need to have a way to validate this data. Mm. Like we, you get in a result from this pipeline, 
And then somehow you need to know if that's correct, at least for a subset of it. Mm -hmm. So we did uh, do that in the paper that is published and we were really grilled on that part by the reviewers like how we approach that, how we actually know that our result is valid. So that, that's another detail that in science, you will be grilled on that. So you will have to think about the way to yeah, validate this. Yeah, our science team looked at 1% of the data. Uh, we, we did the same painful marking for 1% of the data. Uh, so that, that's kind of a big task considering how much data it is. We actually, for this paper, it was 96,000 image tiles. So all of us looked at 9,600 tiles, a little bit shared work. So we were three people. So each of us looked at 3,000 tiles, yes. <laughs> yeah, even as, was worried. Even as trained scientists and people who are very familiar with these jets and fans, did you, did you do as well as the citizen sciences did? That's an excellent question. And Mac, uh, our collaborator who actually helped us a lot with understanding the psychology of the citizen science because she had experience in doing the Planet Hunter, which is another famous one. And uh, she was uh, doing the data analysis for that. So she likes to tell the story that Anya, me and her completely did not agree. <laughs> so, so that's the funny thing. Uh, even the professional does not agree. And that's always also a good argument for the people who, who say only professionals should do that. What is the good of that if they can't agree? So, so really the argument is here, let the Gaussian, uh, the Gaussian math uh, really help you. The wisdom of the crowd. If you have 30 people looking at the same thing, the average answer would be correct. That is the fascinating math fact that still blows my mind after all these years the average will be correct. So let it help you. And uh, so, so that's how it, it, it came to be that uh, we had to defend this situation uh, in the paper that the scientists don't agree, but we use statistical means in comparing our results with the catalog results and they were comparable. So overall, statistically, they, uh, we could prove that we're doing the same thing as the, the science, citizen science. It really sounds like psychology kind of played an important role here with, you know, saying, hey, we're going to be dealing with tens of thousands of people. We need to know what they're thinking and how their minds are working so that we can, that's nuts. I didn't, I wouldn't have thought about that, you know, think, being such an important factor. How does the human mm. mind work? You know? We didn't <laughs> think that. Style. Yeah, we didn't think that either. <laughs> it was tough learning. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I think that we're just about out of time. We're a little bit over our hour. Uh, but, but Michael and Anya, thank you so much for, for joining us today and, and telling us all about your citizen science project, uh, Planet 4. It was super interesting to hear all of these uh, cool things that you learned along the way. Well, right. Thanks for having us. It was, was, was yeah. big fun. Yeah.